You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. The Event Horizon Book Club contains all the books written by the guests you've heard on Event Horizon, as well as some of our personal favourites. You can find it on Amazon by scanning the QR code to the right, or by clicking the link in the description. So head on over and come read with us. Event Horizon absolutely receives a kickback from every qualifying purchase. So every time you purchase, you're supporting further episodes. In today's episode, John is joined by Peter van Dockum. Peter van Dockum is a professor of astronomy and physics at Yale University. His research interests span a wide range, from stars and stellar populations to the most distant galaxies, as well as astronomical instrumentation and telescopes. With his colleague, Bob Abraham, they initiated the Dragonfly Telescope Array in New Mexico, the largest working refracting telescope in existence. In addition to research and teaching, Professor Van Dukum currently serves as Chair of the Physical Sciences and Engineering Tenure and Appointments Committee at Yale. Dr. Peter Van Dukum, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Now, Doctor, you work, at least most recently, in black holes, very fast moving black holes ejected from colliding galaxies. Now, what is the the physical mechanism for the ejection of a black hole in that situation? Yeah, I have to say it's it's a new topic for me. And I came to it from the observational side. That is, we saw something we couldn't explain any other way. And so I had to learn about this topic, read up on it, papers going all the way back to the 1970s, and and I hope I did a good enough job and that my understanding was sufficient to at least to to make a reasonable case for this particular object. But there are two main mechanisms for ejecting supermassive black holes from the centers of galaxies. One is if two black holes merge, then the merged product can get a kick due to gravitational recoil, that's what it's called, and can leave a galaxy. The other mechanism, which, which produces a bigger kick and might be what's going on here, is if you have several mergers of galaxies that bring their own black holes into the merger product. So if two galaxies merge, they both bring a black hole with them, and they deposit that in the center of the new, of the new galaxy. Those two black holes will orbit one another for quite a long time, for a billion years or, or even more. And during that time, what can happen is that there's a third galaxy that merges with the other two. So you have a a merger product of three objects, and that will bring its own black hole. But then in the center of this new galaxy, you'll have three black holes, and three is a crowd in in the circumstances. Three-body interaction leads to the ejection of one of the three black holes. The two remaining black holes will form a new binary. But one of the black holes is, is predicted to be kicked out in that, in that situation with very high velocity, so high that it can escape the galaxy altogether, that the gravity of the galaxy is not sufficient to, to keep the black hole bound to it. Now, once the black hole is ejected, it's moving through a lot of material from these galaxies, gas and dust and everything. What effect does it have on that material in its interstellar medium? Yeah, that's something that was first worked out in in the 1970s, actually in the context of explaining the radio jets that were then discovered associated with galaxies. So now we know that those radio jets have a different origin, but people thought for a while that maybe they were explained by these these runaway runaway black holes. And so this this is a long history, this interaction of a black hole with the gas around galaxies. And the general idea is that the black hole will shock the gas. It will sort of run into this gas at such a high velocity that the gas gets compressed and gets shocked. And then behind the black hole, the gas will then cool and sort of settle again. But in that cooling process, it will, it will get to high enough densities to form new stars. So essentially, the net effect of the passage of the black hole is that it creates a wake behind it of newly formed stars. So those stars form out of the gas that was already there, 
and the black hole comes and leaves and has a very short time to interact with the gas. But the net effect of that gravitational interaction and of the, of the shock that it's, it causes can lead to star formation. Now, I should say that theory is not worked out much in a modern context because this, this whole topic has not received a lot of attention over the ensuing decades. I think now I know actually that several groups are now simulating this behavior again and, and trying to see what with modern tools what, what the simulations would predict. But the general idea is, is fairly well understood. Now, this, this idea of moving black holes and ejection, what eventually happens to the black hole is, is essentially intergalactic space, a domain of these things where we may not be able to detect them, but we can infer that there's wandering black holes all over, right? Absolutely. It is, this has also been a prediction for, for 50 years that these wandering black holes should exist and not just occur, these three-body interactions should occur. And it's been recognized for a long time that, that this should happen fairly regularly, maybe as much as sort of one, once per galaxy, per massive galaxy, that, that a black hole should be ejected at some point in its history. But again, as you said, it's, it's very hard to detect these things, these roaming giant black holes. It, it's quite incredible. These, these have masses of 10 million or even 100, 100 million times the mass of the sun are basically completely invisible unless they happen to eat something, which they might do once in a while. But once they leave the galaxy completely, they just, uh, yeah, they travel through intergalactic space, probably not encountering anything ever again. But this one, we think, is still on its way out. So it left the main body of the galaxy but it created this trail of, of stars uh, in the gas around the galaxy, and it, it's close to escaping altogether, but it isn't quite there yet. That's, that's an amazing idea that intergalactic space is a home to silent monsters wandering the universe for almost eternity, although I guess they're evaporating technically. But, but it's yep. <laughs> just the idea that that's what intergalactic space is. Now, with with galaxy mergers like that and, and three-body interactions like that, that's actually not that uncommon, galactic mergers on that level. Now, what happens if you kick it up a notch with like four <laughs> galaxies? Does that change the dynamic? No, it, it, it could happen. It will happen. The question then is, will the black hole, the, one of the three black holes, have already been kicked out before the fourth one arrives, right? But again, the, 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 the result of the first kick will be a binary black hole in the center. And then if a third galaxy, a new third galaxy comes in, or a fourth galaxy, if you keep counting, then that black hole might be kicked out too. So until that binary black hole actually merges and forms a new single black hole in the center of a galaxy, there's this potential, there's this binary black hole waiting at, at the heart of every galaxy that, that has it to kick out anything that comes in. So it, this should indeed be fairly common, these, these ejections. We, th we think the theory is fairly well understood for, for how this works. Unless there's some mechanism that causes these binary black holes to merge together very quickly. But that's not what people think happens. This, this particular observation helps, though, because it, it would show, if we confirm the black hole, that this is actually something that does occur in real life. You know, one thing is to uh, derive that it should happen and to think it should happen fairly often. But to actually see it is, is a whole different thing. And it's like, okay, we, we, we know this happens. We can look for other examples. We know now what to look for. And we can even eventually estimate the rate at which this happens. Now, the candidate for this, the, the recent discovery of a, a candidate for a, a black hole that's being ejected that, that you detailed in your paper, this particular one, how do you confirm it? I mean, what can you do to tell that this is actually a, a black hole being ejected? And what help is the James Webb Space Telescope in this? Yeah, and fortunately, this is sort of classical science where we have a, we have a hypothesis that, that fits all the available data, but it also makes predictions. So it can be falsified and it can be tested, which is, which is great. You know, that's what we like to see. In this particular case, what should happen is as the black hole leaves the galaxy, it doesn't travel quite alone. It should take some stuff with it, namely the stars and the gas that were already bound to it before it left the galaxy. 
So there is there is stuff that's that tied to these black holes in the centers of galaxies. And as the black hole leaves, so the stuff leaves with it, or at least a fraction of that stuff. Also, as it moves through the gas, particularly in the inner parts of the galaxy, it can accrete some new material uh, that it didn't have before. And so in the end, what we expect is that the black hole isn't quite alone, that it has stars with it and it has some gas with it. And what we think is that that gas can be detected and it would have a very unique signature because it's moving so fast around the black hole that it would have very high velocities. And the whole, the whole thing, the whole system, so the black hole and its gas, would have a high velocity compared to the galaxy because it was ejected at such high speed. So we have a pretty good idea of what it should look like. And then we did the calculations for James Webb, and it turns out that that telescope, fortunately, is, should just be able to detect it. It will take about 10 hours with, with James Webb, we think, to, uh, to do it, and it's impossible with any other telescope. But we were awarded time for the, the upcoming year to, uh, to try and look for it. So that would be the, the absolute confirmation of, of, of this idea. We see those lines that are associated with the black hole um, after predicting them that they should exist. Then uh, we're pretty certain that, that this is what's happening. We can also, and this is a bit more um, speculative, look in, in x-rays. So we put in a proposal to do that. That is if the black hole is actually active. So if the black hole is eating gas or stars and it has an accretion disk and it is actually um, in the process of devouring material as we speak, then it could show up in, in X-ray radiation. So we're, we could look for that as well. So there are ways to make, make sure that uh, this is what we're seeing. And, and we hope to be able to do that within the next year. Now, speeds, so the ejection of a black hole, are we talking like relativistic speeds? Is it that fast? Just give us a sense of what the speed of these things are as they get ejected. Yeah, we actually could derive the speed from the data that we had. It's because we, um, we can age the stars behind it. So we can tell how old the stars were. And then we see that the youngest stars are at the tip of the, of the street, so nearest the black hole and the older stars are somewhat further away from it. And because we know how old the stars are, and we know how long the streak is, we can tell how fast the thing moved. You know, it's basically the, the age and the distance, and then it's like, okay, how long ago was the black hole at this spot, and at this spot, and at this spot? And so um, what we derived was a velocity of about 1,600 kilometers per second. Now, for comparison, the speed of light is 300,000 kilometers per second. So it's not rel relativistic. It's, it's much lower than that. But to escape the galaxy takes only about 300 kilometers per second. So it's like three times faster than what is needed to, to escape from the galaxy. And also about three times faster than anything else moves in, in a galaxy. So it is a, is a particular signature, again, because not many things are able to escape galaxies. So just the fact that we see this high velocity is also a strong indication that we're looking at a, at a runaway black hole. Now, dark matter, how does that play into this? In other words, does the reason that it's hard to escape a galaxy intimately involve the dark matter halo of that, that galaxy and that it would actually be easy to escape if it weren't present, right? Yeah, it would be a lot easier because the galaxy would, be, would have a much lower mass and so have a low, lower gravity to keep, the, uh, to keep the black hole. There's also another aspect, and that is we think that every galaxy is embedded in this giant dark matter structure that we, that we call a halo that's way bigger than the galaxy itself, you know, like 20 times bigger than the visual, visual extent of the galaxy. We think that that dark matter object, dark matter halo, is not entirely empty, but is actually filled with gas. And that gas is very difficult to detect under normal circumstances. Interestingly, this streak that we see from the black hole draws a line in that gas. So normally we can't see that gas, but because the black hole bumped into it, caused this shock and ultimately the star formation, we get this, this pencil beam survey, this very narrow streak through that gas that tells us how big the galaxy really is. Also, the velocities of the gas out there tell us about the dark matter that's there. And so we, we get this, this unexpected and, and really exciting insight into the surroundings of galaxies from these, these escaping black holes. So we devote some time in the paper actually talking about the, the implications for the, the stuff that lives around galaxies. So we might have this, this new, very unexpected probe of these, these regions that are normally almost unobservable. 
Now, in regards to the interaction with the gas and the halo, that probably is hydrogen, right? So are you looking in like radio um, for like neutral hydrogen emissions? Or what are you looking for that, that you can see from this gas as the black hole moves through? Yeah, it's, what we see is the, the excited states of hydrogen and also of oxygen. And so we look for the Palmer series of hydrogen, which actually emit in, in optical light that's redshifted in this case to the uh, near infrared. So that's what we see, the hydrogen indeed, and also oxygen. The oxygen is particularly sensitive to shocks. And what we have at the, at the tip of this feature is an incredibly bright knot of, of oxygen emission that's brighter than the entire oxygen emission of almost any galaxy in the sky. That is, again, we explain it as the shock of the, of the black hole. And so we see it in those particular uh, species that are excited by the shock. And so we'd also like to see it at the gas at, like you said, at radio wavelengths. Then we might be able to make an entire map of, of the gas around galaxies. But that's a little ways away. We, we can't quite do that with current technology. So we see a particular kind of gas. We see warm gas and shocked gas. We can't see older gas. Um, but still, it, it gives us this probe that we otherwise wouldn't have. Now, in regards to mapping the gas, when you get to that stage, when you have the technology to begin to really do that, does that promise to shed light on dark matter? In other words, can we sort of infer the behavior of dark matter by watching this gas? Well, we can, um, because the distribution of the gas should be a reflection of the distribution of the dark matter. So it, it should trace where the dark matter is. And one particular prediction from dark matter models is that it leads gas to flow into galaxies in particular ways. So when a galaxy is, is in a certain reg regime of mass and distance, it should show streams of gas go all the way into the center of a galaxy, but come from very far away. And it's been a goal of, of us and of many other groups to detect those kinds of streams directly. So the, the, the environment of a, of a galaxy is predicted to be incredibly complex with the dark matter and the gas all not, not in much equilibrium, but mergers happening and gas streaming in along these filaments. And it would be fantastic to, to map that directly. We're actually building an, an, a telescope out in New Mexico, the Dragonfly Line Mapper, that might be able to do this in ionized gas for nearby galaxies. So that is a, that's one of the goals, to see the complex uh, behavior of the gas around galaxies with, it, with that telescope. Tell us more about the, the Dragonfly Telescope. I, I was particularly interested in that it, it, it uses Canon lenses off the shelf, right? Yeah, yeah, it's been a, it's been a really fun project. It started now, it's, it's almost 10 years ago that, that we, we began with it. And it was uh, my colleague, Bob Abraham, uh, and myself, we were having dinner in, in Toronto after a thesis defense. And we were sort of, um, you know, we, we, we were a little unhappy, not with the thesis, the thesis was great, but we were reminiscing about how fun astronomy used to be when we were grad students ourselves and postdocs, that we could work on these, uh, these projects and devote our time to science. And now we were on committees and doing administrative work and writing grants and doing big surveys. And then we decided, let's, let's do something really small, just the two of us, for fun. You know, something, something a little out of the ordinary. And independently, we had thought about imaging the sky for low surface brightness objects. So large objects that are very faint, but have a lot of light if you add it all up. Right? So you spread out the light over a large region of the sky, relatively speaking. And that, that was an area that was a bit neglected because it's, it's difficult and it's sort of a different regime than what you'd normally get, which is faint things that are very far away and small, like with Hubble. And then we, we had this idea of, of building a telescope to do that specifically. And I had experience with Canon lenses, these, these, these high-end telephoto lenses, because of photography of insects and dragonflies, which I, which I love to do. And I knew they had these very special anti-reflecting coatings that, that might make them just perfect for this kind of work. To me, that was all kind of a theoretical discussion and sort of a um, pie-in-the-sky discussion. But then it turned out that Bob actually thought, why not build the thing? Because it turned out he was a closet amateur. He had a ton of telescopes in his backyard, and he, he loves building things. So together, we, uh, we hatched this plan to, to build a telescope out of tele Canon telephoto lenses, specifically for these faint big things in the sky. 
And it started with, with one lens that we took to Mega Antique, this dark sky preserve in Canada, to test it out. And it, it was great. We, we saw new things right away. Then we took it to New Mexico, New Mexico skies, and uh, built a three lens array and an eight lens array. And we got students involved and, and started to manage the project. It got bigger and bigger, obviously, as these things as these things go. And now we have a 48 lens array that's been doing great, you know, and, and doing doing wonderful science and with a lot of student involvement and leadership. And we're building the follow-up, this, this narrow band imager that I just alluded to that has 120 lenses and, and will actually map the sky in, in the light of these emission lines of ionized gas. And so it's, it's been just wonderful and, and great. What's the upper limit? I mean, how many lenses can you chain together to produce an effective aperture, I guess you would term it? I mean, is there any upper limit that, that I mean, well, of course there's an upper limit, but I mean, how many lenses can you go to? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked that because we purposefully set it up to be basically limitless. <laughs> that is, we, uh, we use the Internet of Things protocols so that every lens is its own independent little telescope that just communicates with these uh, Internet of Things protocols with a central computer and, and that means that there's no yeah there's no like cabling or or port uh, or or data flow limit it's purely physical like how many can you put together and, and keep working you know in a, in a reasonable <laughs> with a reasonable setup but uh, the data are then automatically combined and so the the ultimate data products are are not that big because as you said you basically pretend that you have one giant telescope that where all these little apertures are combined into one one image. So the 120 is is in my mind we're still prototyping and we can go up quite a bit from there. But that that array already will be completely unique. Observe things that we've never seen before. It, it's a new regime, uh, particularly the uh, ionized gas that we're mapping. It's just way fainter than what we've been able to do over very wide areas of sky. Can't wait, you know, to see what we'll we'll see. Because with, with Dragonfly, we, we've already discovered entire new galaxies that we didn't know existed. It's been, the universe has been extremely cooperative so far. There's been a lot to discover, and, and we didn't know right beforehand. And, but it's been, um, it's, we've been very lucky in, in terms of what was out there and what is out there still to discover. Now this just seems like really cost-effective astronomy. <laughs> yeah, yeah that is true. I mean, it's, it's not cheap, cheap, but it's, it is, yeah. I mean, we're basically piggybacking on a ton of development that these, these companies have, have put in, right, to develop these codings and all that. We're also using uh, exquisite filters, you know, on the narrowband setup that companies develop for other purposes. So the, the whole idea was to use off-the-shelf materials for a state-of-the-art telescope with this segmented aperture technique. And that's really paying off. So you don't have to pay, essentially, for all the uh, research and development that, that these companies put in. And they get it back by selling millions or, or at least thousands of these units to consumers. And so we're, we're sort of making use of that, uh, that development. Other astronomers could use the same technique to build arrays as well that might be more custom tailored to different work, right? So, I mean, it, it seems like there's a lot of wiggle room, so to speak, here with, with a setup like this. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I should say there's also other people who have been thinking along these lines, not so much typically for this very deep imaging of faint, faint big things that we've been doing, but more to detect varying objects in the sky. So what you can also do is you can point all those all those lenses to different different parts of the sky, and observe the, the essentially the whole sky in 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 one shot with a sort of a porcupine of lenses. I think it's called every scope. And there there are other initiatives like this, and I think it'll it'll proliferate. Computing power gets better, and particularly these these product communication protocols are very important and data handling and cloud computing. All those things are just set up to improve and increase. Yeah, so I, I think purpose-built telescopes for specific goals that, that use these kinds of technologies will, will be very powerful in the future. So by using this technique, you could set up all-sky surveys and take very rapid photos, right? In other words, you could do all-sky surveys on level with like uh, the Vera Rutan telescope that's almost seeing first light. So you could do that much cheaper using this method, I, I would imagine. Yeah, I mean, 
you don't get certain things like with, uh, of course, you know, with the Vera Rubin telescope, you get exquisite resolution of small things. These lenses are very good at imaging big things and big fields of the sky fast. They don't have very good spatial resolution. So, you know, there's trade-offs and all these things. But if you wanted to detect like the next bright thing that flashes in the sky, then all you care about is, is area and timing, like cadence. How often do you observe how much of the sky? And that is a regime where Vera Rubin is going to be good, but not the best. You know, that's just not what it's designed for. And so, yeah, I think there's, there's a lot of scope for that as well. Uh, I also think that um, we can couple these lenses to spectrographs in the future. And I think there's going to be particular spectroscopic applications too, where you combine uh, many apertures into one deep spectrum in the end. So I think there's a lot, a lot of room and scope for, for development there. Now, photography. Actually, before I ask that question, what about chaining different groups of these telescopes together as an interferometer? Would that be of any use in, in using these instruments? Well, they are not super precise. And so I think that would be, you know, that kind of development would lead you down a path that requires tolerances that they can't quite meet these, uh, these kinds of setups. So, you, yeah, it, it is like you have, to, you have to know what you're sort of after. <laughs> and there are particular niches where this is going to be very powerful and very quick. I don't like to be motivated, actually, by cost in the sense that it's nice to be able to do something cheap that you could also do with something more expensive. But the beauty of, of Dragonfly and, and the narrowband is that for no amount of money could you do this with, a, with another telescope. That to me is the most exciting, are the most exciting things. You know, where you, uh, yes, you're cost effective, but you're also in a regime that is just entirely new. Because the, discovering new things like the runaway black hole, or new populations of galaxies, there's just nothing better in astronomy, at least for me. That is really the, the, the best thing to, to find something that no one has ever even thought about seeing that way is just uh, incredible. Now, a particularly beautiful insect, the various species of dragonfly, led to this, your photography, your, your hobby of photography of these insects. Tell us about that. And what is it that, that <laughs> it's just amazing that an insect can inspire an entirely new type of telescope. But tell us about your interest area there. Yeah, I, I really like dragonfly photography. <laughs> That's true. Um, yeah, I, I did a book in 2015 with, with dragonfly photos. With, uh, with Yale, uh, Yale University Press. And that, that took about eight years, roughly, of, of photography, uh, going to various places, capturing specific stages of the life cycle or, or behaviors, you know, feeding, for instance, and mating, all those things. And um, yeah, I, I, dragonflies are, are amazing to me. It's also, I, I used to photograph spiders. Uh, <laughs> But then uh, with macro photography of spiders, the, the closer you get, the more gruesome they get. And with and so in the end, I was like, you know what? I, I just, it's okay, I'm, I'm done with the spiders. With dragonflies, I had the opposite. It's like the closer you get, the more amazing they become and, and the more beautiful they are. They have these amazing patterns, color, colored wings, colors on their, on their bodies and, and these subtle behaviors, like the breathing that they do. You can see, you can see them breathe you know, the whole body is, is breathing, that you can just watch through a telephoto lens or a macro lens. And um, yeah, there's something in incredible about it. For me, it's a way to, to connect to nature and to capture something that is uh, very difficult to see otherwise. You know, and there's maybe a link with the astronomy. It, dragonflies are fast, they're fast flyers, they're a little skittish, so it's hard to come close to them. But with these techniques, these, these, these wonderful cameras and lenses and, and patience, you can capture them. You can, you can you know, grab something from nature that, uh, that exists and occurs every day, all the time in summer, and take it home with you and, and, and hang it on the wall and, and, and enjoy. And that's been, uh, that's been really, really terrific. It, it used, actually, I thought that dragonflies were uh, something that I was interested in only as an adult. But I found uh, a few years ago, I, I found a little book that I wrote when I was eight years old 
uh, in my, uh, you know, my, my parents' house that my brother and I had to, had to clean out. And in that little book, it was about nature, a little nature book that I wrote with, with little drawings. There's several pages devoted to dragonflies, and particularly uh, the uh, metamorphosis of a dragonfly. And, and I wrote back then that it was the most beautiful thing in nature, the metamorph metamorphosis of a dragonfly. Now, I had completely forgotten that I ever wrote that, of course, and that I had those thoughts, you know, as, as an, uh, an eight-year-old. You know, I, I don't think I was wrong. It is, it is quite amazing. It, it happens at night, the metamorphosis, and so you have to stay up all night to, uh, to see it. But those moments are just, just magical, and it, it's, been, it's been great to capture that and to uh, share it with, with the book. There will be a link to where folks can buy the book in the description below. It is called Dragonflies, Magnificent Creatures of Water, Air, and Land by Peter Van Dockum. How hard is it to uh, actually <laughs> photograph these dragonflies? In other words, to get one good shot, how many bad ones do you have to take because of non-cooperative insects? <laughs> I calculated at one point that about one in 200 was a keeper and about one in a thousand ended up in the book. <laughs> so yeah, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it, takes, it takes a lot of patience. The, the, the hardest thing to photograph, well, first of all, everything has to cooperate, right? The, the, the dragonfly has to cooperate, but also the background, the lighting, everything has to be kind of perfect for it to be something that you want to look at more than once. But the hardest thing definitely is, is photographing them in flight. They fly fast and in, in somewhat unpredictable ways. I did want to have flying photos in there. And also there's a lot of behavior that happens in flight, including uh, mating for, for many species and hunting. So I, I needed in-flight photos, and, and that is, is very difficult. You can't use autofocus. They, they fly too fast. They don't fill enough of the frame. And so you can't use a tripod or anything like that. So you have to uh, do it completely manually. So you basically follow the dragonfly through your viewfinder and focus while you're following it and then get the right moments somehow. It, but what happens is you get really uh, acquainted <laughs> with certain dragonflies. Like you're in a particular spot, there's like 50 dragonflies and, and 15 are flying around. But then you'll find the one that is sort of a regular pattern and you be, and becomes predictable after a while. You're like, okay, there they go again, same, same route. Or, you know, that female is about to deposit eggs and then you're like, oh yeah, that's now happening and it's that spot. So you can sort of predict behaviors and, and then it becomes easier. I've, I've sort of focused often on one specific dragonfly that I would follow around for the perfect photograph. It sounds a little obsessive, doesn't it? <laughs> Anyway. Well, actually, what it's sparking in my imagination is this question. Do they have personalities? Meaning if you watch a dragonfly enough, you can tell the difference between how two different dragonflies are going to behave. So can you actually go that far and say, yeah, I see some sort of personality here unique to that insect? Well, uh, definitely different dragonflies of the same species in the same spot will behave differently. So... If, as a scientist, I would say that's the observation that I made. Does it mean they have a personality? Well, who knows? They certainly respond to the same stimuli in different ways. Some are just very fast and very skittish and, and will just not sit still <laughs> or, or, you know, fly quietly. Others will hover and, and actually stop for a while, hover in one spot, fly a little further and stop again. And those are the ones that are my favorites, obviously. I had one favorite dragonfly at one point where uh, the wing was damaged and so very recognizable. And that made it a slow flyer. And in the end, the photos didn't make it into the book because, it, you know, frankly, it didn't look that good. But I was very fond of that dragonfly because it made it very easy to photograph. Now, with the dragonflies, do you ever find yourself imagining, because that is a very different form of earth life than what we're used to, what we are. Does it, does it spark wonder about what alien life might be like out in the universe somewhere and that if this planet can produce this level of diversity there must be crazy diversity in other biospheres on other exoplanets we may never see that we need one close enough to to actually study but one can imagine just by watching the dragonflies you can sort of begin to imagine alien life do you ever do that for me the dragonflies had a it was more connection it was it, it's or is more connection than otherness I felt more connected with nature and part of the same whole 
weird as they look. Then sort of an idea of these creatures are so odd. The spiders actually had more otherness with. I really don't like spiders anymore. But, but you know, of course, there are incredible life forms on Earth, in particularly ocean vents and places like that, where the whole, the whole chemistry of life is different. So that has been a, a major discovery. I have nothing to do with that, of course, but that's been a major discovery in, in biology and, and the understanding of, of the variety of life that it can flourish in, in extreme environments that, that we used to think is, is inhospitable to life and be very hardy. You know, tardigrades can, can live for decades in, in a sort of suspended animation state and could, could make very good space travelers if we ever wanted to colonize other planets. We should, we should bring some tardigrades. So yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm pretty hopeful that these efforts to look for life in, on the, the icy moons of Jupiter, etc., will pay off. I'm, I'm sort of an optimist when it comes to that. But it's not so much because of dragonflies, but more because of the, uh, the other life forms that we now know exist on Earth. Well, the biodiversity it just shows just what life is capable of by studying this planet. And it, it seems yeah. to be extremely resilient. <laughs> so I wouldn't be surprised anywhere you have liquid water. I, I wouldn't be surprised if you had a good chance anyway for at least microbial life. But it's fun because the biodiversity of Earth shows you what's possible and that you can end up with a technological civilization on, the, on a planet that also is inhabited by dragonflies. <laughs> Two very different but related forms. Right. Of that is a good way to think about it, yep. <laughs> that someone can point a, a telephoto lens at, at that creature. Yep. And then turn around <laughs> and turn it into the same instrument into a telescope array. Right. So is it, the, is, it that, is it actually the same lens? So the telephoto lens that you use, well, I imagine you use a bunch of them, but is one of the, the lenses you use that same Canon lens that you employed with, with the telescope? Is it the same model? Well, uh, not quite. So we're using a 400 millimeter f2.8 lens, which is quite heavy in, in the Dragonfly array, because that's the largest aperture lens that can be commercially made effectively. So it's sort of the, the highest of the highest end lenses. It's too heavy for handheld photography. That's the issue. So it, it, it produces incredible photos of Dragonflies, but only with a tripod. And dragonflies is, uh, it's not a good topic and not a good subject for tripod photography. So these lenses are used a lot by nature photographers. That's, they're made for nature and sports photographers. Those are the two main purposes of, of that lens that we use in dragonfly, um, but not so much uh, for, the, for photographing insects because they're, they're too fast. It, it did help in the sense that both in sports and nature photography, you often have situations with difficult lighting and, you know, imagine a marathon runner coming toward the finish line and the sun is low and, and behind the runner, right? So then you need a lens that does not have any flare, if, if you can avoid it, and uh, delivers excellent contrast even in extreme situations. And that's what these lenses are made for. That's, that's why these coatings and, and, and the whole thing was developed. And that's exactly what we need for this low surface brightness imaging that we're doing with um, off the sky. So there, there is a link with nature photography and, and sports photography, the needs of that and, and the needs that we have for finding new kinds of galaxies, which is not entirely obvious, but it is, uh, it's fortunate that it, that it worked out that way. Actually, one lens that I did use, a smaller lens, we actually used as a, as a guider on the first Dragonfly array. So the actual physical lens, my lens, that I used for Dragonfly photography was part of the first array because it was the best lens that we had to, uh, to, to, to guide, uh, so to make sure that the telescope was pointing in the right place. So in other words, good for photographing a distant elephant, not so good for a flighty dragonfly, essentially. Exactly. Yeah, you need to, you need to have a fairly light lens, you know, because again, you're standing there, manually focusing it and following the dragonfly. <laughs> yeah, it is, a, it is a weird thing to do. <laughs> Where do you typically go to photograph them? I mean, what, what geographic area are we talking about with these dragonflies? A lot of the photos were actually taken in, in a little pond here close, close, to, uh, close to where I live in, in Cheshire, which for some reason had a lot of dragonflies, has a lot of dragonflies. I think it's because it dries up in the, in the fall and that means there's no fish. So the dragonfly larvae, they can survive in, in the mud. But uh, there's no fish to uh, to eat them. It's my my 
pet theory. I don't know, but it's it's uh, it's filled with dragonfly and and other life. And then on trips, you know, when I um, went to Arizona or, or other places for for work or other purposes, I would try to uh, sneak in a day or two, find a wetland and find the local species and and the local behaviors and, and photograph there. So most were taken in the um, American West or uh, here, right here on the on the East Coast. Also some in Florida, basically mostly all over the U.S., a few in Europe as well. Whenever I was somewhere near a wetland, and, and still, uh, if I am somewhere near a wetland, I'd like to go and, and see what's there. So are the uh, dragonflies, the species, uh, I, I assume are completely different from North America, which are probably many, and then also Europe. So do you see, I mean, very obvious species differences between the two continents? They're sort of the same ecological niches and, and similar related species. So it's not, it's not as different as you might think. The main differences are with uh, tropical species. So when you go to Mexico or, or to Costa Rica, you'll see, um, or to uh, Southeast Asia in particular, which I have not done, there are extremely colorful dragonflies that are bright purple and, and, and quite amazing. So that's still on my, uh, my bucket list to, <laughs> to, to go to one of those places, particularly Southeast Asia, and, and, and photograph those more exotic species. But between Europe and the U.S., it's, it's subtle differences. You know, you can almost recognize like, oh, this is a version of, of that species in, in, in the U.S. So what's next for the Dragonfly Telescope? What is the future of research using the instrument? Yeah, we're doing two things. With the array that we have, the 48 lens array, we're imaging the entire sky in the north. So we, that's sort of the ultimate thing you can do, <laughs> that you have an archive of all the, the big the big fuzzy things in the sky. So we're not going very long in any one spot. So the, 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 it's not very deep, the exposures, but it's everywhere. So the idea is that anybody can ask for any point in the northern sky, hey, what is the faint low surface brightness emission at this spot? And then call up our um, ultra wide mosaic data. So that is uh, that project is nearing completion. It took a few years of, of data taking. And then with the narrow bands, so that's the new, the new thing, the 120 lens array, that we're still building. So we now have 30 lenses that are operating, so a quarter of the array, and we're ironing out all the, all the issues, of course, that came up uh, trying to build it. That looks, everything looks good. And so that should be completed in about a year. And then the goal is to image the gas that lives around galaxies. Ultimately, hopefully, the cosmic web. So... That is the filamentary structure that, that fills the universe in dark matter and that should also have gas that might be detectable. And that, that is sort of the holy grail in this field to, to see the connections between galaxies in, in, in gas and to, to bring all that in front of us. Um, but, but we'll see. We'll see if that works. But definitely we're, we're going to see new things. We're going to see gas way further out than ever before around any galaxy that we point at. So it'll be it'll be exciting times. Now, the ejected supermassive black hole and looking for confirmation of that and studying it with James Webb. What's the time frame? I mean, when when do you think that we'll have a paper, the next paper on the subject? Well, the first thing that will happen is actually data from Hubble. So this summer we'll get imaging from the Hubble Space Telescope of the system in ultraviolet light. So that's unique to Hubble. Uh, James Webb can't do that. It can't reach these short wavelengths. And you can't do it from Earth either. But with Hubble, you can in the ultraviolet because it's outside of our atmosphere. What we expect to see there is the shocked gas that, you know, where the black hole traveled through. So we think that we might see an incredibly beautiful shock at the front of the black hole that could be resolved with Hubble into this sort of cone shape. It's called a, a, a MAC cone and a, a very nice, bright, thin streak behind it. So if we see that, some people would argue that that would already be confirmation of the runaway black hole. It would certainly show that something is moving at supersonic velocities through the gas there. You know, that, that's what it would, uh, would demonstrate. And then we still wouldn't know for sure that it is a black hole, but it becomes difficult to come up with anything else. So that will come this summer. And hopefully uh, the observations will go okay, and hopefully we'll write the paper then in the, in the, in the fall. 
early fall. The James Webb Space Telescope observations that should be really confirming will come a little bit later. You know, the scheduling depends on everything else that's happening with uh, James Webb. And so somewhere in the next year to year and a half, uh, those data will be taken. All right, Doctor, thank you for joining us. And I look forward to further updates and I hope you come back and give us updates on this candidate. Yeah, sure, I know, I'd be happy to do that. Event Horizon and my channel are now available as a podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube memberships. Early ad-free episodes, bonus episodes, and sleep-focused content. Sign up now by clicking the links below to your platform of choice.